Captain Picard wants his junior officers to learn, learn, learn. Counselor Troy hypnotizes Dr. Crusher. And what does helm control have to do with medical cross checks? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. And My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today, we have our review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Episode 6, Lonely Among Us, story by Michael Halperin, teleplay by DC Fontana, the legend, directed by Mr. Cliff Bowl. This was November 2nd, 1987. We have an amazing special guest, everybody, Mr. Legend himself, makeup supervisor himself, Michael Westmore. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I feel like I could have just introduced you for like 20 minutes because everybody knows your name. Everybody knows everything you've done. And we are just fascinated and in love with your career. Uh, this episode, of course, this entire season is sponsored by Grandpa One, Mr. Tim Baum. And uh, also this episode specifically, special thanks to Austin Balhagen. All right. Michael, welcome. Pleasure to be here. The, the man, I, the myth, can, the legend. I can forget other things, but I remember all the episodes. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> I, For me, it's been really um, a, a trip because there's so many I don't remember. So many. Really? Do you remember this one, Denise? Yes, I remember. I mean, re because I remember the the aliens, you know, and mm -hmm. and but I kind of forgot about the whole energy thing. Cloud. Me too. You know, I did. You yeah, know, I did. I, I, I'm, I did. St I'm still not sure about that whole piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I'm like, what is happening here? What exactly mm -hmm. is going on? It, it was a little odd, you know. I mean, I like the two layered stories going, you know, simultaneously. But mm -hmm. um, that whole energy thing was, uh, I don't know. I don't know about well, that. <laughs> Michael, this must have been like the first big task, it seems, uh, when you were working on Next Generation. Because I'd, I'd heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, but i had heard that uh, the Sele, uh were created kind of off off site there was it was another group that was doing that but you were tasked of course uh this episode was legendarily called the dogs and snakes everybody talks about the dogs and snakes episode mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but michael can you walk us through what the the meeting was like what the thinking was like did they just say make anything up or did they specifically no, say we need here. dogs there's mm -hmm. when i was hired uh three things had already been approved before i came in was what well, one was the Ferengi, the other was the dogs and the lizards, <laughs> and there were colored mock ups of them. And uh, the, the Ferengi, I had a conversation with uh, Gene Roddenberry, and we did change them a little bit. Uh, it was a little too, too busy, and using spirit gum to try to make them hold on uh, wasn't going to work with the design, so we, we changed those around a little bit. Uh, the person that did these sketches was uh, Andy Probert, and mm -hmm. Andy was there from the beginning, and he gave me the sketches for the uh, the dogs and the snakes, and uh, <laughs> went to work with them. I really didn't make any changes to Andy's drawings, and I I have some around somewhere. I don't know where they are. It's like you know cases tucked everywhere. Um, the dogs I did at the studio, uh, took a cast of, it might have been Mark Alimo, uh, the actor in one of the dog heads. It was, it was, I was gonna ask you about that. That was actually Mark Alimo playing the main Antican uh, yes, wow. with all of those lines. And I was the Mark Alimo. I was thinking about you, Ciroc. I was like, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's any possible way that no Ciroc way. is gonna recognize the, the way Mannerisms, he emphasized, no. yeah. Huh. Yeah, no, it, uh, with, with, with Mark, though, it was the beginning, because that was the beginning of a long career of many aliens, and he was probably the best Cardassian ever hmm. that, uh, that, that we did. Hmm. He had perfect uh, features for it, and with the dog, because Mark had such a long neck that hmm. everything he did, uh, he wasn't like this here, which we had a couple like that. 
but uh, he was able gave him tremendous amount of movement to be able to do it. So uh, we did the dog, and I had Andy's drawings, and we sculpted them in a uh, the lab there at Paramount, and I made the molds on them and ran the rubber. We had a little lab that the studio uh, gave me some room to be able to bring my ovens in and things, and uh, turned out, you know, made the whole thing and uh, wound up painting it and, you know, adhering the hair. And uh, there's a couple little things I'll tell you about after the snakes, but regarding the movements. Uh, mm -hmm. With the snakes, what happened was, is I was the only one there in the very, very beginning. And then uh, a man by the name of Werner Kepler came in oh. to assist me yeah. for a, a couple seasons. But mm -hmm. that was it. So uh, I couldn't be doing dogs and snakes at the same time. So there's a lab over in North Hollywood called Makeup Effects. And they helped us out a lot over the uh, years. It's like making electronics for us, the uh, little antennas for the Andorians and mm -hmm. things. I would go to them because as they just had a lot of mechanical genius to, to add to it. So they did the snakes and uh, did the head, the clay and made the mold on it and approved everything and when it came time to take the raw sculptures and they're the raw rubber that's been done to uh, paint it and prepare it the the dogs are fine because i actually poured the rubber and did all of that but with their snakes that they were supposed to two days before they're supposed to start shooting they bring the three heads to me, and I'm expecting the same soft rubber that I've made my dogs out. And in fact, I don't remember them telling me they weren't going to do that. Mm. They were hard as a rock, and they had no flexibility to them. And we had no time to go back and run those again because they were so thick around the hood in the back that uh, we had to go with what we had. And uh, painting at that time, too, it it uh, I I found called shoe magic, which was the spray that shoemakers do if you want to change the color of your shoes, but did not have the sophisticated <laughs> setup we had later on with airbrush and um, all the technical things we could, we did for painting for shading and highlighting and everything, and I I became a master at doing. Uh, shoe magic spraying and it's just like you'd spray it with one color and then like taking what you'd call a frisket and a piece of paper cardboard and and be able to do shading around it and highlighting and that's how the snakes were done but the the drawback to them because i wanted flexibility so it, yeah. there was no way they could even do this or that because this thing was like a rock on their head and wow. uh, so that's the way they uh, survived for uh, the rest of next generation. I noticed the best they could do was just kind of like lean forward. They were trying to or do like turn, a, they yeah. would turn from their shoulders like that. They couldn't, God. they couldn't turn because how much did it weigh? Hmm? How much, how much did that head weigh? Oh, well, not much because they made them out of styrofoam and uh, oh, uh, yeah, okay. a rigid okay. styrofoam. Now, if it wow. had been a flexible styrofoam, it had been okay. But right. it, was, it was rigid. So they re really were stuck in that type of a position. And so they were all painted up. The hair was laid on the dogs. But then you start looking at them. And this this has gone on through my whole career is always looking for the little details, and the extra things we can add to it. So with the dogs, uh, one of the guys that uh, was working for me, Steve, he used to be a puppeteer. And mm. I was saying, gee, the mouth, and I, we can't do anything with the mouth except to maybe do a slight thing. And Steve says, well, why don't I make a, a, a little a wire basket that would fit in the mouth? And he did. He made this little thing that went in the mouth. And whenever they bit down on it, on, like that, the mouth would open. So the dogs could actually do this. They couldn't curl but they still could open and close like that, which was brilliant. And then mm -hmm. one day figured out that uh, the, it, Mark could stick his tongue through the center of this little wire basket, uh, like that. So I made a nose tip or a tongue tip 
that literally slipped over. It was hollow on the inside. It would slip over his own tongue. And so when he opened that and he stuck his tongue out, it would stick out between his teeth. And wow. so it gave Mark at least, it gave him some life. Uh, yeah. I don't remember yeah. Mark having contact lenses in his eyes, but uh, painted him up just like a dog. <clears throat> and then there were areas where there were seams and not being able to cover them. And that's why wherever you see hair on uh, the dogs, because mm. they're bald on top. Mm. Uh, hair yeah, cover. I mean, he has a lot of, you know, snarl and, and it to his face. He has, the dog has a lot of movement. Yeah. You know, you really and, notice and that. that. Helped. <laughs> yeah. And with the snakes, again, of course, it was, I was, I died every time because we, we did not have the movement that would really, he would have had to have moved his head to make his body do one of these things too. So mm -hmm. we, we, we missed out on that. But I, again, for the snakes, I made another tongue that was about six inches long. And on the end of it, it was like a snake with a little forked tongue. And on the other end was a little cup that would fit over the, the end of his tongue. So he could mm -hmm. take and stick his tongue out and wiggle it. And so and, and it is, and it, <laughs> since it was six inches long, he could pull it back in. So it looked like he was... <laughs> Sticking his tongue. <laughs> wow! But these are the little. Wow. But these are the things you need to make something come to life. You know. Um, how, how much time do you get, uh, Michael, to to prepare to, to for an episode? Any from anywhere from five minutes to. Uh, <laughs> it, it was very fast. We shot seven days, started a new episode. I had a giant calendar there uh, in my office. And I had to literally keep track of when's it going to shoot and what has to be done prior to every one of those days. And uh, I can't say we ever missed uh, through the 18 yeah. years. We were, well, there was one thing that happened on Next Generation when uh, Q and Whoopi Goldberg were sitting at a bar and Whoopi picks up a fork and what they wanted to do was jab him in the back of his hand. And they asked me, I got a call. I'd gone home like at 9 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, do I have an arm that Whippy can have? Now, had they asked me in the afternoon or something, the answer would have been yes. No, I didn't have an arm that looked exactly like Q's arm that to, with, with hair punched in it and everything. But I told him, I said, you want to shoot it tomorrow as an insert? You'll have it. So it's the only time I can ever think of where we wow. we didn't miss the boat. They missed the boat. And I was asking mm -hmm. something that the director thought of at the last minute of whooping. Mm -hmm. So when you see the show in that episode, you see her going with the fork, but you never see it actually hit the hand. And they probably would have cut that out anyways at that point, uh, whether the studio would have left that in. But uh, otherwise, um, Everything worked really well because I had good crews. I had good assistants uh, over the years. And it, uh, it, it just to, it, it either worked well or it was going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Michael, you know, you're the, uh, the grand master of makeup in the business. And um, I, my question is one, what got you into wanting to even do makeup and also, um, who was the person that inspired you like mm -hmm. in that in that department? Well, to start with, at the beginning, my my fax machine's gonna go off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there now. I knew where the off switch is. Captain, uh, incoming message. <laughs> it starts in the late eighteen hundreds, actually. Wow. My grandfather was a wig maker and a uh, hairdresser in the 1890s. And he was Winston Churchill's barber. And Whoa. around 1906, he, he had salons. He packed up the family and came to basically uh, Canada and then traveled all the way around. And my grandmother had my grandmother had 18 children. So, and only seven of them survived. 
Wow. He uh, wound up in Hollywood in 1917, and my grandfather started the first makeup department in Hollywood. Uh, following him was my dad, whose uh, big movie that he did was Gone with the Wind. He died when, in 1940. Uh, Purse, who was the head of Warner Brothers. My dad was the head of Selznick International. Purse was the head of Warner Brothers. Earn was the head of RKO. Wally was the head of Paramount. Jesus. And uh, Bud was the head of Universal. And mm. Uncle Frank, who uh, never really took over a department head, but he was very close to Cecil B. DeMille and did all his pictures. And uh, so that's, that's where it all started. With the wow. Well, that's <laughs> that's like the, the monopoly. Yeah, that's it's a, a monopoly. Right there. <laughs> it's a a dynasty, yeah. yeah. Now, now, Michael, didn't Wally do my grandfather, work with my yes. grandfather? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because in fact, he used to play cards with him. Yeah, we when when Michael and I met, you know, when I first was cast, um, you know, we 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 had this rare um, opportunity of being like, you know, third generation mm -hmm. in the business, you know, and that our relative, you know, his his uncle had had done my grandfather Bing's makeup when he was um, making all those Paramount films, you mm -hmm. know, and, and everything. So it was it was just really a wonderful kind of connection. I had wow. the chance of making a going over to Dorothy Lamore's house. Uh, there was a bunch of pictures called The Road, yeah, Road to Morocco, Road to Alaska, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. In Road fact, I Singapore. went with my mom, worked on Road to Alaska, where they had this huge snowstorm and everything. I went to used to go to work with her on Saturdays. And uh, I got a, to do a commercial with Dorothy Lamore, which was interesting, is you walk in the front door of her house and there are pictures of her all around. The living room in sarongs and stuff. I mean, <laughs> an image, you know? she was a knockout. She was in all those pictures with my grandfather. Yes, yes. So that's that. Yeah, she was. Yeah, always it, it, it's amazing. And Bob Hope. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. um, I I wrote my memoirs, which were published in nineteen or in twenty seventeen, and I could just kept coming up with one thing after the other, and the people that I've met all the way from Elizabeth Taylor to David Bowie. Um, it just yeah. goes on and on and on. Somebody will bring up a name. I'll go, I met them. I did that. I mean, that was her. Yeah. And, and my whole career has been like that. Uh, not having uh, stayed at one studio because I was universal for 11 years. And Butch Patrick from the Munsters and I are still really good friends. And, oh, wow. He's a, yeah. I, I met him a few times. What a lovely, lovely Isn't man. He? Yeah, oh, God, yes. I was I was the, his idol because I was single. I had a sports car, and he would come <laughs> into my makeup room, and I'd have to put a board up across the the chair to be able to glue on his ear tips and uh, put his eyebrows on, and, uh, paint him gray, and everything. And he used to tell me how he idolized me, <laughs> you know, and uh, because I was just so cool. So it uh, still are. He was, Still <laughs> are, baby. Still he are. Was, he was such a nice man, though. Such yeah, a nice, he's, nice man. You know. Yeah. And uh, wow. do you recall an incident that gave you the most trouble as far as like coming up with an alien that just is uh, a big puzzle for you to try to On figure Star out? Trek? Yeah. No. Wow. No. I uh, what I did is I had a huge library of books. I would read the script and find out what planet we're going to land on. If it was a sandy planet or a water planet, I would base my aliens on that. And but I had books. I mean, I didn't want to do uh, Star Wars and say try to think of something that is you know, fantasy. So almost, almost, I would say everything I did had some connection to Earth, which made it a lot easier on me. Uh, mm. Because I could say it's an aquatic thing. Ah, do, should we do turtles or should we do blowfish or whatever? And then mix them up. Yeah, turtle with a blowfish, you know. And, and, and <laughs> colors. It wouldn't. You wouldn't paint the alien red. By the way, you can destroy the whole thing. So I kept the colors where the alien is from in the, uh, uh, the whole theme of what we were doing. The palette. The palette of. Uh... Yeah. It, was, it, was, I, it was it was made life easy for me. It's like I first found that out when I was doing Michael Dorn and the Klingons, and I found a book 
that had cross sections of dinosaurs in it. And so I based mm -hmm. every Klingon head I ever did, and we had about 32 of them uh, finally in stock, uh, on a cross section of dinosaur vertebrae. So, so it, which uh, dinosaur do you remember? Uh, which dinosaur you uh, pulled from for Michael Dorn's? I just go through the page. Mm -hmm. You could pick almost any one of them out, whether it was a brontosaurus or a T Rex or whatever. It, Sagittarius, yeah. Different <laughs> spines. They all had different spines. So, that, oh, is that is cool. So amazing. Yeah. Uh, I had to find a common denominator to work with because yeah. when I took Star Trek, uh, I called my wife and uh, after they, they they said, you want you to do it. And it was only like two days before, on a Thursday. And I told them I wanted to think about it and call them. And they said, well, you got to think fast because we just started doing tests on data on Monday. So I called Mary and I said, well, you know, the first one only lasted a couple of years. And this is probably going to be the same. So uh, Marion says, go ahead, take it. You're not, we were not, we're not going anywhere. So uh, I accepted. And at that same day, I was meeting up with Whoopi Goldberg because I had made some gums for her, for her routine. She did Mom's Mabley, uh, comedian. And uh, it, uh, all of a sudden, we did tests on Brent and uh, came out with the colors and everything. And we, in fact, we tested, you know, everybody's makeup, things, right? But the, we really didn't have any aliens in the first episode with Q. Uh, right. it's, it started with the traveler and, mm -hmm. and the snakes mm -hmm. and the, uh, and the, and the uh, dogs. And from there, it just kept, kept adding it. And it, it, it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, I would get ideas from everywhere. I just, there was a, um, a Thai restaurant in Studio City, California. And we were going to dinner there one night. And there was a, a picture store next to it. And there was a great big picture painting in the uh, sitting in the window. And it was a picture of a woman with a spoon in the middle of her head. And uh, I, I know said, where this is going. <laughs> I said to Mary and I said, you know, I'm going to use that someday. But and it was a couple of years later. When you finally got Mark in the chair, and I'm trying to think, what are we going to do? And we got to do something up here, you know. And I remember the spoon, and uh, <laughs> that's where it came from. Yeah. I had no <laughs> idea. I've never heard that Cardassians and spoonheads came from a Thai restaurant uh, advertisement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so, how, how closely did you work with uh, with wardrobe? Because they, I mean, they they kind of really go together the the makeup, the wardrobe. You know, um, so, so, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I'm asking. Yeah, I have a trouble of interrupting, so if I do, just tell me to shut up. I'll, <laughs> I do. Um, some sometimes there's a, a, a some tension between wardrobe and makeup and whatever mm -hmm. in, in films. I can't say or remember any time I have, uh, especially with Bob Blackman. Bob Blackman and I would literally check with each other uh, on wardrobe. I would check to see how high the sleeves were going to go, how low the neck was going to go. And he would check with me to see if he has to make a costume come up to here or if, mm -hmm. I, if he was going to make a big neck. And this happened with the female Cardassians especially uh, was a Mary Crosby who played Armin Shimmerman's uh, love interest. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a plate, a throat and a plate down here that would come down low uh, to cover it up. So Bob and I, I mean, there was never any question. Whatever he wanted, he got. And whatever I wanted, I got. So, you know, that actually makes me think of something. And we only have a couple minutes left, but real quick, Michael... Was there, speaking of Bob Blackman, was there ever a time where you saw, you know, the, the, the wardrobe he was going to use for an alien and that in, actually inspired a change in you? It kind of got the creative juices flowing where you thought, you know what, maybe I'll add this or I'll change this. Or did you ever make any changes that weren't just practical? Well, just like that, you know, having to lower the thing. What were we going to do? Just paint or gray? No, made a full latex sheet with the scale, same scales we had on the rest of the head mm. on the sheet and maybe a few little bones sticking out of it. Uh, the same thing happened with the board where any place uh, there was exposure and there wasn't a lot, but wherever the, there was, whether there was a tube attached to his face or whatever, 
we were covered or if our wardrobe needed something covered up, we would cover it up. Mm -hmm. No, it was worked very. In fact, even with uh, Bill Tice, when he was there, he was there only the first year or two. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, you know, it's easier to work together than it is to pull the opposite way. The only times I would say you kind of pulled the opposite way was when a director came up with a concept that didn't work. And that not only didn't work with me, it didn't work with the actor. So, uh, I mean, directors sometimes would come in and tell Brent what they wanted to do. But that was it wasn't data. And Brent would go to him and say, you know, data wouldn't do this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I had a, a director on one of the movies that wanted to change the Vulcan's color to gray. And I, I literally had to go to, to Berman and say, you know, this isn't going to work, you know, so he was, I'll take care of it, and, you know, and he did. And, and so, Michael, also, I quickly, about the, the sketches, did they also include the hands, um, or is that something you have to, that you made up, like, on the fly? You know, the, the sketches for uh, the, the the dogs and lizards and the snakes, they uh, yeah. they were in there. They were in there because it, and it, the, the the dogs kind of had they weren't full paws because they had fingers on them, and the the snakes were mainly like dragon with long longer fingers and mm -hmm. scaly and uh, matching colors. Um, over the years, we had what we did for a lot of the characters was to make a back of the hand and all they would do is have to glue that on and we made fingertips and I had all kinds of fingernails and everything. I had a, a, an array of stuff that has been collected over the years. That's why they could all of a sudden bring somebody in uh, and we could put them together pretty fast. And I hired people that had the ability. I had my A, B, and C makeup artists that I know that could do certain things that I could just literally throw it to them, a uh, man by the name of Brad Look and, and Scott Wheeler and people, where I could just say, here's the stuff, put it on and I'll see you when you start painting. And uh, it, it's just, um, I, I wanna say it was another whole career. And it, it's a career for me that I still love and I'm still involved with. I used to go to conventions up until, and I missed a lot of nice things that Star Trek did in the last couple of years mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID. I wasn't going to go and sit, uh, you know, and breathe, and especially <laughs> people aren't going to wear masks at all, which was interesting at the uh, uh, Golden Globes. People's Choice Awards were afterwards. And so many people had come down with COVID after the, the Golden Globes. They didn't show up for the People's Choice. They, and they had been hired to give out awards and receiving awards. And they, they couldn't go because they were sick. So it's, uh, mm. it's all yeah. a chance with that. Yeah. Well, Michael, this has been so amazing. And we really, really hope you will consider coming back uh, and joining us. Oh, again. I've already considered. Are you kidding? Oh, what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like we, we have so many more questions yeah. for you and so many more episodes to inspire those questions. Uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time out today. Really cool of you. Uh, thanks so much. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. All right, and everybody. You, lady. <laughs> oh, so good to see you. So, so good. Especially yeah. having just watched these episodes and just how unbelievable you made us look how mm. just so beautiful so beautiful well, thank you because it will live on long after i'm gone my darling long after we'll we'll still and, and also let me add also uh michael that you're such a classy gentleman and you you handle yourself like working with you is such a pleasure your patience your temperament <laughs> You are a class act to work with and beyond your skills as a makeup artist, who you are as a human being and the person has been exemplary. So thank you for that, too. Oh, my God. I, I have to. I absolutely, Sirak, I'm so glad you brought that up, because, again, you know, for those of you watching and listening who, you know, aren't actors, your day starts there. Your day mm -hmm. begins in the makeup trailer. 
So the the mood is set, the tone, the vibe, the 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 anxiety, the everything, you know, begins there. And you need to have a calming, um, kind presence to uh, begin your day and, and to feel safe and so that you can create what you're there to do. And Mr. Westmore, you just exemplify that. You are you are so um, A plus in that regard, and you always made me feel good when I came. Yes, but you know, I made a I made it a point to literally meet everybody coming in, at least in the very beginning, <clears throat> to to do that because I wanted to know them and if they needed something. I don't think we really had it ever had any problems i had one problem where some young actor didn't want to wear appliances and he quit <laughs> i helped him uh, but <laughs> yeah. um you know it's it's if just only it, star trek star trek yeah. was just i want to say it's it, it was a joy one of those things you do for free it was so much fun you can say that now but yeah, yeah, I, mean, I hope you didn't say that 30 years ago and i have to it just say that the person behind me my entire career was my wife Marion is my wife Marion and we will have been married 58 years this year wow uh we met on a tour at universal and uh she was uh, Edith Head's model at the time oh my god uh, yeah, legends, the history you legends, got man, is legendary. Legends, yeah. Generational right? history, like passed I know. down. God, it's amazing. And by the way, Michael, you've been in makeup, doing makeup professionally for sixty years. Yep, more. Actually, I, I mean, started in sixty-one. Wow. And I continued to do it after after Star Trek finished. Hmm. I did an Indian film, uh, East Indian for two years where the main character played 10 different characters in the movie. Wow. <gasps> yeah. Wow. Well, and, and of course now your kids are doing makeup, right? No. Mackenzie's an actress. Ma uh, uh, okay. Michael. Yeah. Has, Michael, was no, Michael was an editor on Deep okay. Space Nine. And when we wrapped up, I gave him about two and a half gallons of glue that I had left over. He redesigned it, and now he sells that glue all over the world, mm -hmm. and he sells hair dyes all over the world. And, wow! Uh, and my other daughter, the one that has the uh, huh? the brain problem, um, she is uh, involved in a entertainment management firm. She's married wow. to the president. <laughs> so oh, that's a little that involved. Wow. <laughs> he was a secretary. <laughs> <and started. laughs> So I found wow. the original sketch here that was actually used when you based your character off of the, uh, here it is, see? Oh my God. Wow, good job, <laughs> Ciroc, nailed it. Wow. My, that's my crappy drawing there, Michael. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and on that uh, note, uh, everybody at home, stick around. We've got much more to discuss. And uh, we're really looking forward to the next time seeing you on the show, Mr. Michael Westmore. Thank you so much. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. <laughs>